Father, we thank you and praise you. We give you glory. As we dive into your word today, would you use it to ignite our hearts? Would it remind us that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities in heavenly places? Lord, as we see these supernatural acts that you perform, Lord, would it stir our hearts to bring you glory, but would it also remind us that we are a people under authority who have authority over the things that we're talking about today? Would it give us a new sense of power and anointing as the songs that we've even sang during the course of today, I have power as a believer in Jesus Christ who is filled by the Spirit of the living God. Lord, would you illuminate our hearts to the reality that that is our identity. We are who you say we are, not who we believe ourselves to be. Would we walk in that power and that anointing today? In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So we're going to be dealing with some powerful spiritual stuff today, and I am seriously praying that God will use it to set your hearts on fire, that you would be changed when you walk from this place today with a new understanding of who you are called to be in Jesus' name. I want to start with a quick story. Um, Not too long ago, I was in McDonald's, and when I walked into the McDonald's, there was a young guy who was working there who typically would have been working behind the counter at the McDonald's, and they had set up these new kiosk-type things that are there. And now, I guess, at McDonald's, like everywhere else, they're wanting it to be self-serve, where we walk up, and we go, and we enter our order on the kiosk, and then we go pay there. And I'm talking to this young guy, and they're trying to direct me to using that instead of using the teller. And I'm like, dude, you're putting yourself out of a job. I didn't say that to him, but this is what's going through my mind. They're using you to put yourself out of a job. That, that's ruthless. What is wrong with them to have them do that, you know? So I, I kind of felt bad for the young guy for a moment. And that's the same feeling that I got as I was reading the scriptures that we're going to dive into today. Because we're going to dive into the book of Luke. And Luke is a physician who was serving under the great physician. And I think every day as each day went by, I'm sure he was rejoicing because we hear all these stories where he hones in on the deliverance from demons. He hones in on the healing of people in a physical sense. But he's following Jesus and Jesus Jesus is like putting him out of a job at the same time, you know, so he's walking around, and this is the kind of spirit. So I felt a little bad for Luke, but man, there's some powerful things that we're going to witness here. He brings them to our attention, and I pray that we'll begin to walk in them. He sees people healed. He sees people delivered. He witnesses miracle after miracle, and he no doubt had great awe in all that he was witnessing, not just as a physician, but in the way in which he communicates it with us. The first story that he communicates about a healing happens in Luke chapter 5. There's some friends that bring a paralyzed guy to the feet of Jesus. These guys no doubt love their friend. They had heard all the rumors about Jesus who's healing people. And who knows, this is total speculation. This is in Capernaum. This is near where their headquarters were. So maybe, maybe Luke even treated this guy at one point during the course of his life that That's total speculation on my part, but I got to thinking about that. How crazy would that be if some of these that he's talking about, he had actually tried to treat in a physical sense? And it kind of concludes in in Luke 5, verse 20. Seeing their faith, he said, friends, your sins are forgiven you. And the guy gets up and walks. His physical problem is resolved, but his spiritual problem is also resolved at the same exact time. I love where it says, seeing their faith. Now, the guy himself, I don't know where his faith was at. He might have been part of the their faith that they're talking about, right? So it was three guys. It could have been all three of them walking in faith, or he could have been pretty discouraged. He's been walking around, not walking around. He's been in this condition, right? He can't walk around. So he's been in this challenge for all these lives. Maybe he had given up hope, but it says here, seeing their faith, he was healed. That tells me you and I have great power. We have power that's locked inside of us that maybe we're not using Jesus saw their faith. Do you realize that your faith can change somebody else's circumstances? Think about that for a second, the power of that. 
God still heals. God still delivers. God still sets free. Prayer changes things. It also changes people. It changes circumstances. It opens doors. It closes doors. Are we walking in that anointing? Are we walking in power? Do you feel like you are? If not, I think today we need to remember who Christ says we are and the power that is locked within us so that we could start to live that out. Don't you want to walk in power? Five of you? Okay, the rest of you will pray for you. Seeing their faith, it's sadly, sorely something that seems so lacking in our generation But what would happen, Journey, if we were different as a faith community? That we could be that kind of friend for one another. That we would love each other greatly. That we would love each other enough also to speak the truth and love to one another when we're being jacked up. You notice I said in love, right? In love to one another. You don't just call somebody out not in love, right? That does more damage than it does help. But when we see people going down the wrong path, I think that's partially a lost art in Christianity as well. We're complacent, we're, we're complacent, but we're complicit if we don't go out there and start to share with them when we see people heading in the wrong direction. It's a very hard thing to do, but it's something we have to do because we love the people around us, right? Would we walk in that kind of anointing where we would go to any length to see our loved ones, our unsaved friends, Know who Jesus Christ is, get healed, and experience the gospel in a real and tangible way. That we would invite them to church, that we would invite them to small groups, that we would invite them to our homes, that we would invite them into conversation where we share the good news of the gospel with them and tell them that there is hope in this hurting and crazy world that's around us. There's hope. Do you have that hope locked inside of you? I pray you do. If you're living a woe is me Christianity, it's time to stop right now here in Jesus' name. Today is the day of your change. The spirit of the living God is in you. Do you believe that today? It is in you. We sang about it. May it become a reality in our lives this very morning. If you think there's only one situation where someone else's faith helped bring healing or deliverance to another, in fact, Luke recounts at least three different stories in Scripture in his gospel of where this occurred. The second one that I found is in Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 1. It's subtitled, The Centurion's Faith. It says, After he had finished all these sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick to the point of death who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent him to the elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house. The centurion sent friends to him, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word. And let my servant be healed, for I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at them, and he turned to the crowd that followed and said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who he had sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Do you know that you are a people under authority who are of authority? Do you realize what the Bible says about you? Christians should not be walking around lacking power. Man, God claims some amazing things about you. I wonder, are we walking in them? Why are y'all getting so quiet? Do you want to know what the Word of God says about you? I found about 70 scriptures. I'm going to read all of them. To, no, I'm teasing. There's a, I'm going to read five different ones to kind of make the point about what God says about you, what he says about our day and age. Mark 16, 17. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons and they will speak in new tongues. 
Do you read anywhere it says in A.D. 70, this all stopped, and we're not going to do any miracles, there'll never be any healings, and it says, and these signs will accompany those who believe. Matthew 16, 19. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Are you praying like that? Are you using the authority that is within you to bind the demonic powers and principalities and heavenly places that are trying to hold you back or possess your friends or oppress your friends? You have the power to kick them out. You don't have to put up with that in your house. You could bind and loose them in Jesus' name. 2 Timothy 1.7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear but of power and love and of self-control. It says, God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of what? And what? And? Oh, self-control. Why'd y'all get so upset when I talked about a budget earlier? God can give you the power to accomplish that in these natural circumstances as well as these supernatural ones. He can help you have power over that. We don't have to live like others live. We can walk in self-control. Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed. That's the spirit that resides upon you. It was not just for him. We're going to sing about it in the last song that we do today. You have the ability to set the captives free by the power, name, and anointing of Jesus Christ if we will start to walk in it and get tired of putting up with it. John 14, 12, my last one in this series. Truly, truly, I say to you, does it say lie, lie, I'm telling you? It says, truly, truly, I say to you. He had to repeat that because we can't grasp it in our natural minds. We can't grasp this. Whoever believes in me, is that you? Do you believe in Jesus? Whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Why are we not seeing healings? Why are we not seeing deliverances? Why are we not seeing demons fleeing? I'll give you what I perceive to be the answer before we close out today's message. But this is what I think we should be walking in. And guess what it says? And you will do greater works. Can you imagine? Greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. This seems to be so scarce in our Christianity. It seems to be something that in our scientific minds and the way in which we've been trained by the powers that surround us, we suppress and we put by the wayside. But when you read scripture, guess what? As you've already seen and will see, over half the times that Jesus even brings physical healing to somebody, there's actually demonic roots behind it that he casts out that heal both the spiritual and the natural at the same time. Why are we so ready to discount the supernatural aspects? Why do we walk in fear of dabbling into those areas of the supernatural when we have the power of the living God inside of us? Would it not be so? Would God change us this very day? Do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know the power that resides within you? Mark 16 says you have the power to cast out demons. I wonder how many people's circumstances, how many people could be delivered from addiction, how many people could be delivered from mental illness, how many people could be delivered from a variety of things if we had eyes to see in the spirit instead of just treating them in the natural. We could see mental institutions cleared out in Jesus' name, right? I mean, how awesome would that be? How many of those things that we attribute to the natural are actually demons at work that should be cast out rather than fed? What do I mean by that? I'll expound on that. It should be cast out rather than fed. Let me describe what I mean. I say this with caution first. There's not universal truths. There's a lo- there are universal truths. I don't mean to say it that way, but 
not all medicine is bad, let me put it that way. Like, so right now, I have high blood pressure. It is a natural condition. I'm praying that God would deliver it, but there's some things I need to do in the natural as well. I need to eat better. I need to work out more. I need to do some of the spiritual and physical disciplines that I'm supposed to be doing, so partially I'm to blame for that condition. Does that make sense, right? So I'm having to take these pills that help regulate it that I don't want to be on forever. I need to get my butt in gear and go start working out and eating right, right? So some of these are me completely natural. So there are great things that God has done by giving very smart people wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to make medicine that really is helpful. I mean, amen. But there's also a very dark side to it at times. Let me give you an example. Um, so say... I've known this to happen to many people in our own congregation. Maybe they got in an accident in some way, be it at work, in a car accident, you name it. They got prescribed Oxycontin or some other opiate-based drug. It was supposed to be a temporary help for them, but sadly that temporary thing became a permanent fixture in their life. They became addicted because of that kind of a thing. And then the result is that the government says, oh, we're going to go crack down on these pill doctors who are making all this money off of selling opiates, right? So then heroin ends up being cheaper than the actual prescription drugs. I see a lot of you shaking your head. And then these people go out and they end up getting on heroin that's a street level drug, right? That's not as clean as what they do. They don't know what they're getting it mixed with. And our friends and our family members are dying left and right around us because of that addiction to these opiates, right? And then sometimes, rather than that, they, what do they go give them to try to get off of heroin? They try to give them methadone. And then they get just as hooked on the methadone as they were on the other stuff, and they get no help from it at all. Sometimes these systems are corrupted, and it's all about making money and not about helping people, right? That's the sad truth behind some of it, right? It shouldn't be that way. What about other areas of life, the other dark sides of some of these things? Maybe let me give you a slightly different take on anxiety, depression, bipolar, other things of that nature, right? Again, not 100% universal. But what if these chemical imbalances were not just chemical imbalances, but a huge portion of them were actually demonic oppression or possession that's the root of it, right? And then what, we, what do we do in the natural? Okay, this person has anxiety or this person is depressed, so let's go give them this medicine. Do you know pharmakia actually means witchcraft and sorcery? So when I talk about feeding demons, what do we do? We go give them witchcraft and sorcery, and we exacerbate the situation by feeding the demons. How many of those have you seen where those mass shooters are on antidepressants? And, uh, everybody's shaking their head, right? The problem is we're discounting the supernatural and the spiritual aspects that are at play in this, and you and I are all believers. We shouldn't be. We should be looking First, to what God says, and say, Lord, what is the true root of this? Is it spiritual in nature or is it natural in nature? Your word says that we could cast out demons and we could also heal people, so it don't matter what the thing is, right? You have the ability to interject your faith along with the faith of others to see people get healed, to see people get delivered, to see people get set free. The answer's not always a little pill in a bottle. Can I get an amen, right? And if you're on that, too, though, I want you to use wisdom in it. I'm not saying go throw all that stuff away in an instant. You need to use wisdom. You need to get people around you. You need to talk about it. You need to get discernment. You need to make sure that you don't do something rash because when you start to get those chemicals in your body and you remove them quickly, there can be some bad unintended consequences as well, right? So I'm talking about wisdom here, not talking about throwing the baby out with the bathwater, if that all makes sense, right? But we got to realize that sometimes in this spiritual world that we live in, in fact, over 50% of the time, if Jesus was casting out demons, why are we treating 99% of the time with natural means? Do you think all those demons just went away? There's some of them in this very room right now. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. We need to begin to walk in the authority and the anointing that God has placed inside of our hearts and minds because sometimes the treatments are as bad or worse than the underlying issue. Let me give you one example in the Bible. There's many. There's that story of the demon-possessed guy. He's cutting himself. 
He's tearing his clothes. He's in need of being chained up. What would we do if we experienced that person today? Oh, get them on Zoloft. Come on, Jesus. We've got to get them on Zoloft. We've got to fix this. We've got to take it away from it. Jesus comes up, and he doesn't say, what's wrong with you? He says, who are you? And he says, legion, right? And he casts the demons out of that guy, and they run into a pig, and they run off into a cliff. He sees the problem for what it really is. Would God begin to give us that kind of understanding? I want to encourage you when you leave here to begin to research it in greater detail. There's great books like Breaking Free by Neil T. Anderson. There's other ones that are out there that cover this subject material in great detail for those of you who are interested in it. We've had small groups from time to time that cover this subject material that will help you walk in the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit and deal with these kinds of things with great wisdom. Luke 8.35 gives us the end result. Then people went out to see what happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Why were they not afraid when the dude was out there all chained up? But think about it. How many kids right now are cutting and different things of that nature? Do you think all those are just normal occurrences, or do you think there's some demon stuff that's going on behind it? No, we need to use great wisdom as well. If you are new to the faith, I'm not telling you to go right out there and start confronting demons because you might get your butt whipped. See, there's a story in the Bible of this guy that went out there and he's trying to cast out demons in the name of Jesus. And he wasn't doing so under the authority of Jesus. And the demon replied back to him and said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Who the heck are you? And then he put a whooping on him and he went butt naked up out the house, all beat up, running out of the thing, right? So this is something that you need to do in conjunction with others as you're learning together with wisdom, understanding, knowledge. You don't want to go calling everything a demon. You could do more damage than not by going in and going and taking some young person or something that's dealing with these situations. And you start praying over them, casting out demons. They weren't demon possessed. Now they run from church. They're like, who are those crazy people, right? So there's wisdom that needs to take place. In fact, Jesus used great wisdom, it says. In Luke 9, 1, and he called the 12 together, and he gave them power and authority over all the demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. So what did he do? He put people together to go out there and do it, so collectively they had wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to deal with the situations they were facing. He later went on to do that with 70, and they went out and did the same thing, and as they did, the city around them began to be changed. How cool was that? People were getting healed. People were getting delivered. The power of the living God was at work amongst them, and people got saved in droves. Do you not think we need that in our generation? When the dark gets darker, the light needs to get lighter. We need to start walking in this stuff. But why aren't we? Why aren't we? I'll bring us back to that before we close. Luke 10, 20, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. See, there's a tendency that we have when the supernatural begins to manifest itself. We begin to look after the gifts rather than the giver of the gifts. We get enthralled when we see people get healed. We get enthralled when we're speaking in tongues. We get enthralled when people get slain in the spirit. We get enthralled when we witness these beautiful acts that are supernatural and sovereign of God. But he's telling us here, don't rejoice in that so much as you rejoice in the fact that people are getting saved. See, that paralytic man, his sins were forgiven and he was saved. That guy who was possessed by legion was now clothed and of his right mind. No doubt that meant he too was saved. See, that is God's desire for you and your friends that you would be clothed and of a right mind. That you would be whole and spirit, soul and body. That's his desire for you and I. He wants us to walk in that, to understand these supernatural things that manifest themselves in the natural so that we could begin to live them out and walk in power and in anointing. So I ask you one more time, why do we not walk in that kind of power? I think the answer is found in Luke 9, 23. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. 
For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words... Of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. So what do I mean by that? Too many people in American Christianity are Sunday morning Christians. It's a truth. It affects us all. I was at a seminar yesterday for a sport that I love, and um, I'm not as disciplined as I should be in that sport. And there was another guy who was asking this instructor, who was a world-class guy that was there, he asked him, you know, what do I got to do? Why am I kind of plateauing? Why am I not getting any better at this? Why am I stuck where I'm at? And he goes, probably because you're coming one day a week. He just called him out right in front of everybody. Forty people there, he called that guy out. But he was actually right. The guy was only coming once a week, so every time he came, it was difficult for him. He was not progressing in that sport. He was not getting any better. Every time it was a frustration. He wasn't doing anything outside of there like working out and doing the other things that would make him better when he showed up. He says, if you want to get better, you got to do at least two or three times a week at a bare minimum or you're never going to get any better. In fact, at one time a week, you're not even maintaining. You're regressing. So isn't it the same? If it works in the natural, do you not think it's the same in the supernatural and the spiritual? If the extent of your Christianity is coming to Journey or some other church on a Sunday morning and worshiping God with other believers, that is a great start. But let me tell you, you're not going to be walking in power and anointing. It says we need to pick up our cross daily and follow him. Now, you've probably all had this experience at one point in time. You start working out or you start eating right, and it is absolutely terrible. Who wants to drink that green stuff? I mean, it is not good in the beginning, right? I see you you can relate. Like, it's awful. It hurts. You know, like, oh, it's taking up time that I was using for something else. But, you know, in the spiritual ways, it's kind of the same thing at times. We just kicked off small groups, and many of you are already in a group. You want to know what the devil's going to do to you around week four? You don't need to go to that group anymore. What are you getting from that group? Why do you got to keep going back? I'm telling you, too many of us quit before the miracle happens. Because those of you who have had that breakthrough and you keep working out for three months and you start eating right and you start to see the changes in working out or in your finances or you name it, then you look back a year later, you're like, oh, my God, how could I live any differently than I was? You experience the benefits of that. So if you want to grow in your Christianity, Monday morning has to be the overflow. I mean, Sunday morning has to be the overflow, the starting point of it. You need to get into a small group and plug in and meet some other people and begin to grow. You need to go out there and serve. You need to read your word on a regular basis. And then guess what? When you do that, then we'll see a lot more people walking in the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit. We'll see a lot more people getting healed. We'll see a lot more people getting saved. We'll see a lot more people delivered from the demonic oppression that surrounds us. But you got to go all in. Christianity is not a game where you can hang around on the sidelines and go in every now and then and dabble with it. You will get hurt. You will get hurt if that's how you're living. You will get crushed because the devil is powerful. He wants to take us out. But you could get fit in spirit, soul, and body, and your faith can actually impact not only your life, but the lives of others. How amazing is that? Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment today? Here's how we're going to conclude. We're going to be taking corporate communion together as a faith family. We're going to share in one more song. I'm going to invite the band to come back up right now. But there's a group of people that I would love to be the first ones to get the communion elements today. When we leave, I'm going to leave you with a charge. I'm going to pray a prayer of anointing and power over you that you would walk in it during the course of this week. But here's who I'd like to talk to. Maybe you wouldn't declare yourself to be a believer, but today as you've heard the word of God, it has been at work in your heart, and you're like, man, I want what you have. I want to surrender my life to God. I want to serve him. I want to live for him. Maybe you've experienced the reality of the darker side of the demonic at work around you, and you're like, man, he is absolutely speaking the truth, and you're tired of it, and you're ready for something new. For others of you, you are believers, but you're not walking in power. 
And today's a day where you know that you've got to rededicate your life to God. You've got to go all in. You can't keep dabbling with Christianity. This is the moment where you say, from this day forward, I'm laying a stake in the ground and I'm going to live for you, God. I'm going to serve you all the days of my life. I don't want to look back. I don't want to go in the other direction anymore. I want to be all in for you. And man, I would love to celebrate with you if that's you. I promise I'll do nothing to embarrass you in any way, but I'd like to pray for you. I'd like you to be amongst the first that takes the communion elements today. And then after we're done praying for them, I wanna encourage everybody to grab the communion elements, hold on to them for a moment, and then we'll all pray together at the conclusion of the song. So if everybody just bow your heads and close your eyes for one second, if that's you, and you know today's a day where you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to God, would you do me a favor, raise your hand up real high so I can see it right now. I see your hand, thank you, Lord, and yours. Is there others here today? I see yours, thank you, ma'am, and yours. Thank you, Lord. God is good. Yeah, put your hands together for him. There were many who came up in the first service since we're taking communion together, I'd ask you to do something a little bit different than we normally do. Maybe you're here with a family member. If you raised your hand, would you come up with them here to the front? I'll tell you what's going to happen. Everybody around you is going to clap and be excited for you, and we're not going to do anything to embarrass you, but I want to pray with you. So if you raise your hand, come on up. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you wanted to. Come on up. God bless you, man. How exciting. God bless you. So glad you're here. Stay right here. We'll pray for you. God bless you guys. So glad you're here. God bless you, man. Come on, Journey. Put your hands together for them. There were a couple more. I see some more. Amen. Amen. Well, they're still making their way up. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you. I pray this message does go deep within each of our souls today, that it would impact us to realize we have much more power than we ever could have imagined, not for just our good, which is just a wonderful side benefit of that, but for your glory. You get glory when people surrender their lives to you. You get glory when people are healed. You get glory when people are delivered from the grips of the demonic, Lord God. So today we pray and ask you to continue to move in all of our hearts, drawing us to the place where those who raise their hands are today. That Jesus, we would truly say that you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again that we might have life. Your body was broken for freedom in our physical body. Your blood Blood was shed that we could be spiritually healed and delivered. And today, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for the people who came up and surrendered their life to you or rededicated their lives to you. If you did that after you take communion, I encourage you not to run away. There'll be some people standing up here at the front that would love to give you some next steps in your walk of faith so that you could just kick start it in a great way. For the rest of us right now, I want to encourage you to follow their lead. Come on up, grab the communion elements, sing this song together, absorb the words of this song. They are deep, and let God do his work inside of you. Let's all worship and take communion. Hold on to them to the end. We'll take it together.
says I am. What does that mean in the context of what we're talking about today? In case you already forgot, what did he say about us earlier? Mark 16, 17, and these signs shall accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons and they will speak in new tongues. Matthew 16, 19, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God gave us a spirit of fear but not of power and love and of self-control. John 14, 12, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and greater works than, he, than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. That's what God says about you. That's the power that you have locked within you if we would begin to live it out. And as we lift up this bread, it says, by his stripes, we are healed, right? He was pierced for our transgressions. A crown of thorns was placed upon his head that our minds might be free. So what does that look like tangibly in prayer? Hold up that bread. Father, we just thank you and praise you that first and foremost, our desire is that we would be whole in spirit, soul, and body. We declare your word, Lord, that you says that by your stripes we are healed, that your body was broken, that we might have life, that you were pierced for our iniquities and our transgressions, that a crown of thorn was placed upon your head, that our minds might be free. We take up the authority that you have given us in Scripture and we bind the devil from our house. You have no place in our households. You have no place in our families. It's time that you get out. We kick you out right now in the name of Jesus. We bind you up just like that pig. Go out there into the pig and get yourself out of our house because you have no more rights over our family, over our friends, over our loved ones. We stand in the gap through intercession this very morning declaring health and healing and hope and freedom. Those are the things that we loose into the lives of those who we love, Lord God. We bring them this very morning to the foot of the cross. We bring them to your feet, O oh God, as they did with that paralytic man on that day. And by our faith, we ask you, would you heal them right now in Jesus' name? Maybe God's putting somebody's name on your heart and mind right now or the names of many who you know are suffering. Shout their name out right now in the name of Jesus. Don't be shy. Don't be embarrassed. Who's that name you need to lift up right now asking God to heal them? We don't want to see our friends bound anymore, Lord God. So we release those chains from them right now in the name of Jesus. We lose hope and freedom into their lives in Jesus' name. Father, we lift up this bread that represents your body that was broken that we might have life. We do this today remembering who you are and who we are in light of what your word says and what you said about us. Let us no longer believe the lies of the enemy. Let us have the mind of Christ as we try to discern that which is around us. So Lord, we lift up and partake of this bread in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, as we read your word, it said that we should pick up our cross and follow you daily. As we lift up this cup that represents your ultimate sacrifice, you dying on a cross and thank God rising again. Your blood was shed for the forgiveness and remissions of our sins. So we come before you and say, yes, we want to walk in the things that Eric's been talking about today, but we know we've got some issues that we need to deal with ourselves. Your blood covers all sins. By your blood, we're set free. By your blood, we're healed. By your blood, we are delivered. By your blood, we are saved. So, Father, we lay our own sins, even the sin of complacency, Lord God. We lay it at your feet. We want to walk in the anointing that we've talked about today. And, Lord, we know we can't do that without you. May we cling close to the cross. Might we remember what you did. May we not stray far from it. Would we put in the work and the discipline that we need to connect with you or reconnect with you or grow in our walk of faith? Would that become a reality in our life, something that we just want to do and not have to do? Would we see spiritual breakthroughs abound as a result so that we can go out there and change the world in Jesus' name? So, Father, we lift up this cup that represents your blood. And we thank you for the forgiveness of our sins in Jesus' name. Amen.
I have one final charge for you today. It's found in Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 1. I'm going to pray this as a prayer over you. It says, And he called the twelve together and gave them the power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and heal. I say the same thing over you today. Would that verse become a reality in your life? Would you walk it out this week and the next week and the week after where you'd walk in the might and power and anointing of the Holy Spirit of the living God? You'd see the world changed around you. It would fire you up. It would get you excited. You'll see people get saved. You'll see people get healed. You'll see people get delivered. You'll see people get set free. That is your calling. That is your destiny. I encourage you to walk in it in Jesus' name. Have a great week, everybody. God bless you. Go out there and change the world.